Let me start off by sharing with you a story about a young boy. He is the head prefect at DBSPD with excellent grades. He dreams of studying abroad at a top school like Eton or Harrow. He dreams of going to a top uni like Oxford, Cambridge or Harvard. He dreams of then becoming a high-paid professional like a doctor, a lawyer or a banker. Sounds quite similar to what some of your parents want from some of you, right? Well, this kid worked hard and had luck on his side. He got into Winchester College and then Cambridge. But he became neither a doctor nor a banker nor a lawyer. His final dream changed along the way. Why, I hear you ask? Well, I was that little kid. And wait, this is not working. How do you want me to click this? Ah, yes, it was not on. Anyway, <laughs> I was that little kid. That is, that was me. Wait, come on. Come back. Come back. OK, give me one second. Hello. I know it's on. So where do I click? That one. OK, cool. Thank you. Well, I was a little kid, that's me, back in DVSPD, and I will share with you why my dream changed. It all changed because of an internship. After Cambridge, I worked for two months at a non-profit think tank called CWR, which aims, as you heard, to embed water and climate risks into business and finance. And it was there that I realized how urgent climate change is and that I can make a real impact on the world. So I'm up here tonight to share with you just where we are with climate change and how each and every one of us in this room can help to trailblaze a new climate change path. We have all heard of climate change droughts, wildfires, typhoons. These extreme weather events are already becoming more severe and frequent around the globe. I was talking to a friend about this just last week, and he responded by saying, yeah, yeah, we've all heard this before, but we'll all be dead by the time things get really bad anyway. But is that true? Cape Town in 2017, never before has a major global city come so close to running out of water. California in 27, 2018, just last year, never before has a wildfire season been so deadly and widespread. Even here in Hong Kong in 2017 and 18, never before have two super typhoons struck in two consecutive seasons. Climate change is here already, and it's just getting started. I worry about this because I myself will be impacted. Let's have a look at this map over here. See that red dot? That is where I live, in Yunlong. It's quite quiet, a bit out of the way, but it's not bad, not a bad place. What happens after two degrees of warming? It's underwater. And what about four degrees? The whole area is underwater. The truth is, we are heading towards a three to five degree warmer world by the end of the century. And this is what it looks like. And it could happen within our lifetimes if we don't start doing things differently. So those of you who are more with it will now be thinking, OK, this is clearly not on. We need to do something. So what timeline are we working on? Sorry, but I have more bad news. According to research by the IPCC last year, we only have 11 years until 2030 to close our carbon emissions gap 
and limit warming to under two degrees. We're not even close to doing this because instead of going down, our global emissions actually went up last year. The stark truth is, we're fast approaching a tipping point in our climate. It may be 2030, it may be 2031, or 2035. But beyond this point, our climate goes into a positive feedback loop that we may not be able to reverse. Beyond this point, our homes go underwater. Beyond this point, the scenes from apocalyptic films become real. All this sounds rather hopeless and daunting. Not exactly stuff you want to be hearing about on a Friday night. But hear me out. The night is darkest before dawn. I'm here to tell you that all this doom and gloom is not set in stone. I can do something about it. You can do something about it. We can all do something about it. In an ideal world, we shouldn't have to do anything because governments would be leading the way. But they are failing. Just look at the US. They have a president who openly denies climate change. And so people would say to me, if governments can't do anything, what can you do? And I would feel very helpless. I was just a fresh grad out of uni. I had no work experience. I had no influence in the world. All I had was the will to tackle one of mankind's greatest challenges. No biggie, right? And so what I did was I drew inspiration. I drew inspiration from CWR, the place that I'm still working for. It has grown from just a vision to one of the world's leading water security think tanks in just seven years. Now we have corporates and investors coming to us saying, we're worried about water and climate. I drew inspiration from my director, who left her days as a hotshot banker behind to influence change at a time when people did not care about water or climate. All this helped me realize that all is not lost, that I can still make a difference. And that is why I'm up here tonight at this TEDx event, inspiring others. Of course, I'm not asking you to do what I do. I have devoted my career and ambition to tackling climate change. But you can have other pathways to take climate action. As you become rocket scientists or, I don't know, brain surgeons, you can still make a climate impact through changing your daily lifestyles. Remember, lifestyle change, not climate change. Let me share with you a few examples of how you can do this from my, re my research now, starting with food, and then fashion, and then data. First off, food. Hands up here, who, who likes eating a steak? OK, how about burgers? Well, I love eating them too. But recently, I have begun to cut back on it. Why? Because of cow farts. Seriously, yes, cow farts. Why? Because the cow that the steaks and the patties come from are actually huge drivers of climate change because of the methane in their farts, which is a more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide, which you always hear about. And so, Cutting back on eating steaks, beef, red meat, is a huge, hugely impactful climate action that we can all take. Mind you, I'm not saying that we all have to become vegans, no. But instead, why not shift to a so-called flexitarian diet, where you will have more carbs, more greens, even more white meat like chicken, but less red meat. It could even be healthier. Just for a sense of perspective, if we all shifted our diets to something less meat-intensive, we could be cutting out the carbon emissions of India by 2050. Then there is food waste. Traditional Chinese families are usually quite strict 
by making sure their kids finish everything in their bowls in every meal. I'm sure some of you can relate to this. But when I was young, my mum would say that I'm going to marry someone really ugly if I don't finish every single grain of rice in my bowl. But then, food waste is still everywhere. In industrialized Asia, which we are a part of, a quarter of our food is lost or wasted. And half of that is wasted when it comes to us, the consumer. So licking our plates clean is another impactful climate action that we can take. But that's not it. Let me give you another example. I have a packet of pasta at home that has a best before date of March the 26th. That was about three days ago. But that doesn't mean it's expired or that it's poisonous or that it has to be thrown away. No, I can still make a delicious spaghetti carbonara out of it tomorrow night and it still tastes damn good. So why waste it? Again, for a sense of perspective, if we all reduced our food waste globally, we could be cutting out the greenhouse gas emissions of Canada, France, and Spain combined. Secondly, fashion. If fashion were a country, it would be the fourth largest emitter of greenhouse gases in the world, behind China, India, and the US. So, how do our t-shirts, our trousers, or our dresses fuel climate change? Well, think about the raw materials in this clo these clothes. Maybe leather, and then maybe wool, or cashmere. These all come from the livestock, which, as I said before, emit tons of greenhouse gases. Despite this, fast fashion is still booming. We used to have just four fashion seasons. Now we have more fashion seasons than months in the year. Clothes that don't get sold just get chucked away, or in some cases burnt, because brands don't have the capacity to recycle them. Again, we, as the consumers, have the power to change this. Let me see a show of hands again. Who, who here has bought a piece of clothing they have not actually worn afterwards? Come on, don't be shy. I've done it. You've all done it. Who's done it more than 10 times? Okay, I haven't. But if you have, you should feel a little bit guilty. But still, I can't be too harsh. This is actually my girlfriend's wardrobe, and I'm pretty sure she hasn't worn half of it. Anyway, the reality is, these shopping habits is why fast fashion exists. And in turn, it is giving energy to the wildfires and the typhoons. Maybe we're doing this because we don't know better. But now we do. Can we change these shopping habits? It's time to make, it's time to make climate change fashionable. Thirdly, we're really going out of the box now, data. Every byte of data requires energy to generate and transfer. From the data center, to the cell tower, to the smartphone some of you, I can see, are using. So as the internet grows, so does its carbon footprint. Let me give you an example. Who here has heard of the song Despacito? I see some recognition from the younger ones and blank faces from the parents. OK, so what it is is basically the most viewed video on YouTube and, in my opinion, not a very good song. But anyway, according to analysis by the Financial Times, the five billion plus times that it has been played has led to carbon emissions of over 100,000, equivalent to over 100,000 taxis for one year. That is just one song on one platform. We live off the internet these days. So it's almost impossible dis to disconnect. I find myself looking at my smartphone every couple of minutes. But there are things we can do to cut down on the climate impact of our runaway data use. Take Netflix, for example. 
Because streaming in Super HD takes up so much data, if you stream in lower qualities, you can actually cut down on your data use and, by extension, greenhouse gas emissions. If you want to go further, why not go to your data providers, the smart tones, the threes, and ask them why they're not using renewable energy? There you have it. Fast fashion, food, and data. These are just three of the things we can all rethink to make a climate impact in. And we can go further. We can go further than these lifestyle changes, and we can disrupt and trailblaze with grand ideas. And this is where we, the younger people, come in. No offense to the adults in the room, but we have the creativity. We are not set in our ways. We have the ability to jump out of the box and come up with grand solutions to trailblaze and solve humanity's biggest challenge. I myself saw this creativity just two weeks ago in Central, when there was a school strike for climate action. After all, we are the ones with the most to lose. We have to create a new climate future that we can survive in, that we can have successful careers in, that we can have our own families in. And that is why I'm here of all places. DBS is arguably one of the best secondary schools there is in Hong Kong. You guys have the best brains, the potential and the temperament to succeed in any field you wish. And so what I ask tonight is that you join me as fellow trailblazers to inspire climate action in Hong Kong and beyond. Maybe you can join me in creating an app that promotes and tracks individual climate action. How about a youth education program on climate change? I'm already working to make some of this happen, and your help would be invaluable. Let me wrap up by stealing a slogan from the school strike. The seas are rising, so are we. There is no planet B. Thank you. Thanks.